Hi, I'm Rick King. I chaired one of the task forces and... I'm Joanne Johnson and I chaired the second. So, we've been asked to talk a little bit about, what would it be now, the third? The third. The third. So, what, what kind of advice do we have for the third was the question posted to us, wasn't it? It was. What do you think? You have the most recent experience with all of this. I do. <laughs> the most recent experience, however, was, was short and it was constricted time-wise, and then it was disbanded early. So basically the only thing that comes out of the second task force for the third task force is that don't waste a lot of time getting your baseline. We did the baseline, and that was about all we had time to accomplish. Yeah, you guys did an amazing amount of work in really short time. Right, and one of the one of the drivers of getting that done in a timely manner was Shirley Waltz, and she's on the third task force, so well, that that's goes good. well for them. So they have, I think, based on the what I read in the executive order, a deadline that's kind of right in their face. Not to, not dissimilar to, to the what deadlines have, that yeah. you faced without even knowing at the time you were going to be Gone. put out of business, <laughs> yeah. right? Because yeah. you, you said, let's do this and then we'll yeah. do this, right? And then you didn't get to the second part. So I was just wondering what kind of advice, I mean, what do you, what would you say? How do they get to that initial deadline? The initial deadline, I would say, shoot for the basics and accept all the help that you can get. And there's a lot of help out there. Uh, there's remarkable resources and people doing things in Minnesota and you don't know about them until you've been at this for a while. And so I think that that's probably the best I can do is just say there's people willing to jump in and help make those very fast deadlines in the beginning. So accept all the help that's out there and you can winnow it through, you know, at your leisure a little bit, but those take people whatever did, people are getting. They did come out of the woodwork. They didn't did. They? Every time we had a meeting, especially when we got around outstate. Right. A huge, huge sets of inputs all the time. I'm sure, I know we had lists and you had lists of people that contributed along the way, so maybe one thing is just mine all that, right. all those contacts, right? Exactly. And there's things going on that don't hit press either. So there are folks out there doing things like, there was a lot of press for Comcast doing the low income, um, internet connections for free lunch, that whole structure there. But now also, um, Midcontinent and Mediacom and all of the Minnesota companies, probably a large amount of the Minnesota companies, are doing the same thing and instituting the same program and I believe it'll start right away at the beginning of next year. And one of those cable companies is, is Schobert Cable and Dick Schoberg is also a member of this task force so he can bring that knowledge in with him right. and that can make a nice healthy section of what's going on. One of the things that I looked at when I, I looked at this group, and we had the first time we had a much bigger group, sort of the rule of having all of the, or as many of the people with different views in the room, trying to figure out how to resolve what you do versus having people outside of the process and outside of the room, you know, basically saying, no, nope, you didn't consider our views. I think one of the one of the cautions for this group would be it's smaller so you can move but how do you include all of those viewpoints so you're actually representing as best you can the whole state? I think that that's one of the um, first lessons they'll learn is that there's a lot of disparity in the viewpoints out there. And they have several of them represented, but we did have the luxury in the first task force of having, what, 23, 25, 26, right. however many of us we there were. And that just broadened the knowledge base going in. But I doubt there's anyone on that original task force who wouldn't wholeheartedly say that they learned a lot yeah. going through the process and talking to each other. And so it, it evolves if you have that open communication and you have to build that with a little bit of trust and that takes some time. So That was kind of going to be one of my things that, um, you know, people agreed to everything. They, consensus mm -hmm. built over time through trust and um, I would recommend to this group that they seek ways to get that get 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 trust get consensus get understanding seek to understand 
the other point of view and see where the commonalities are. Today, it seems like the political world is much more focusing on what all the differences are, which might even be like 20%, you know, versus the 80% mm -hmm. that are really common. And if you just choose to focus on those, you can make a lot of progress. But it does take a while to work through all that, doesn't it? It does. It does. They'll be well into 2012 before they even begin to get to there. And that's okay, because if it doesn't take time, then it's not very deep. And, and what you need is the deep connection between people so that they become totally honest with each other. And then you can have a real discussion. And when you have the real discussion, then you can find the meet points, the places in the middle where the good policy arises and the partisanship goes away. And here we're not talking party po partisanship, but, but it's no secret to people that I worked in the telephone industry for over a decade. So I have a parochial view there and somewhat of a protective view. But before that, I was uh, an activist uh, for rural Minnesota working with getting internet connections on a 56k line into k-12 schools in the mid-90s you can't get more gra grassroots than that i think <laughs> and, yeah. and so you know i have a, i have a wider viewpoint i think that what they'll discover is they all have wider viewpoints than they think they do coming in and they really got to seek that and work on that that's, yeah again dig for it that's a and it looks like a good good group it does with Good representation. I, I think Margaret will be an excellent chair, don't you? Yeah, I do. I do. I think she's got uh, consensus building is part of her DNA from my interactions with her, and uh, I think she's really come up to speed quite a bit in the technology world, and I think she has the best interest of the state in her heart. So you know, that's that's uh, what I think would be a really good leader. I was glad to see her name the leader. I think uh, Commissioner Rothman is very engaged in this, wants to uh, make it part of his his program. Um, obviously the governor making it an executive order, actually having a um, you know, press release about it, making it uh, very important, I think is probably uh, even more uh, definitive a statement than we've seen, you know, and actually saying during the campaign and post, you know, border to border broadband kind of sets the bar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the good thing they got or the bad thing, I guess, is we look, kind of left them with with some numbers to hit, and it's in the statutes. So that's a fairly serious matter that they, you know, they need to figure out how to hit those. And that was kind of the thing that you guys didn't get to because you were going to. That's what I think is straight in their in their to-do pile. It's right in the list that the governor gave them of what he wants to see come back. And I think that that is the right way to go about it. You can't just set numbers out there and say, okay, go get them. Who's going to go get them? How are they going to go get them? Uh, how is everybody going to get it? What if everybody doesn't want it? Does that still count as ubiquity? I mean, we have, we have so many of the finer points that we all left on the table for these folks to kind of finesse into something that's reasonable and doable. Right. So the good things have been there's been more federal money dumped in. Right. That helps. Um, I think, I don't know whether maybe you have a view, was the last Connect Minnesota survey positive, negative, or pretty much what we expected in terms of progress. Um, but we have that data. That's pretty recent data that, mm -hmm. that people can jump on board about. And then I think, you know, looking down the, the not to be too isolating about an individual, but we talked about how important wireless could be, and since the original task force anyway, we knew that 4G was on the way, mm -hmm. 3G was there then, the speeds of 4G can actually help us meet some of the goals in a lot of uh, outstate, and we've got a very important player from uh, AT&T Wireless on the, on the, um, on the, this, this group, so I think that's a, that's a huge thing, because I, I don't, I think, you know, people would always say, how are we going to finish this last part that's very rural? How is it going to ever be economic? And I think it, the wireless is the one of the answers. I think that that's something that they'll be able to dig into that neither of us got to right. with our groups. And I think that it's going to be more important than it was even when we were talking about it because of the fact that it's about a quarter of Minnesotans only have a cell phone. 
So we're not talking about a landline economy anymore. And when we're talking about distribution, you can't discount the fact that a cell phone is everybody's, you know, connection to the world. And we have to play upon that. And we also can't ignore the fact that with more and more data going over a smartphone or an iPad or all the other toys that we play with now, it's going to take stronger fiber connections between cell towers. So where do we stand there? How are things set up infrastructure-wise for wireless? We spent a lot of time talking about the telephone industry and their infrastructure and the cable industry and their infrastructure, but really we have to pay attention to all three. Which is great to have uh, have them on that. And I think we've also seen some of the work that some of the municipalities have done, whether it be um, in the telecom area or actually in the broadband area, have matured a little bit mm -hmm. so we can, you know, they can take a look at those models and see what the advantages of those things are. There's going to be some really interesting results that they can put together next year watching some of the new projects that came out of the stimulus funding for one thing and then the older projects like you said that have continued on and are still building mm -hmm. without stimulus money and seeing how those models work. We're working a lot now with more public-private partnerships and three years ago we didn't know what that meant. No, and we now talked we're a lot about it. it. We right? talked about it as right. how it would be the best thing ever. Right. But nobody knew exactly how you structure that. Now we have actual proof of concept um, yep. ideas out there that maybe we can really take a good judgment call in the middle of 2012. The other thing that I thought was good, and um, you know, Blandon was always a big supporter of everything in both of the task forces that we worked on, I think. And even before that, with broadband, is one of the strong things that mm -hmm. they, they were working on in greater Minnesota. Well, now we've got a representative actually on the task force from Blandon, which I think is terrific. I think it's terrific too, and I'm very pleased that there is a real representative mix of rural people on this task force. You have to have that, I think, because even with the low income outreach from the cable companies, they don't go outside city limits. Even the smaller cities, they don't go outside those city limits usually. So what are we going to do about the rest of the folks? What about the low-income people with students that are getting free lunch but live three miles out of town? There's no DSL, there's no cable. What are we going to do for them? And then who else are we leaving behind? And I'm doing a lot of work lately with a group of senior citizens in Todd County, and they are so enthusiastic. And, and they have organized their own digital literacy classes, and they teach each other. And it's, they went out and got donated computers from Freshwater uh, Ed District, and they bought like seven of them for 100 bucks or something. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, people working together to make these things happen. And then I, I took a friend of mine, Joel Ackerman, who runs Homestream. And it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful application. It's just software. goes on a HP touch screen, big print. Senior citizens love it. And it's a, a one-touch video call setup. It's a one-touch 911. It's a one-touch bring up a book, enlarge the printing, mm -hmm. so they have the joy of reading again. Yep. But what I didn't know it would do is, and there's four pilot projects in Minnesota. So one of the pilot projects had a elderly woman in her 90s, actually, who had been in the habit of using her as a former teacher, using her skills to go into school and read to kindergartners and first graders and excite them about the idea of you're going to get to learn to read. Mm -hmm. And she got too frail. She couldn't go into the school three times a week anymore. Set her up with one of these on a video call. She's still reading to those kids. Isn't that great? And I didn't realize this until Joel explained it to me. That's community building. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is important on so many levels. And so when we talked a lot about this is not the solution, it's a tool, I saw that in action. It was really exciting. Yeah, that is kind of exciting. Yeah. Well, they've got their work cut out for them, don't they? They do. Do you think we've taken too much time from them right now by talking about all this when they should be working? I think that knowing where you've been <laughs> is important to where you're going. So we've done our best to give them that. 
And I think that, yes, they have a lot of work in a short period of time. That's why I suggest just take the baseline from last year's report, let those numbers stand where they are, and go out and add to that as much as you can. And accept the help from everywhere, um, because the, you made it clear the last time that we were talking to the commissioners that they will accept that help. And that will be a big boon to them, because you learn a lot from all kinds of places. I learned about QR codes from Ann Tracy, who's interviewing us today. And it's, it's right here on, on my cell phone now. And I didn't, well, it's right next to Angry Birds, which pretty much <laughs> proves that I am technically literate. Um, <laughs> Are you good you at Angry Birds? I am. I'm getting pretty good. I really don't like Angry I didn't like the free angry. ones, but you know what? If you pay the 99 cents and get the oh, real gee. one, <laughs> <laughs> give it a try, Rick. But I'm I do really QR codes all over the place. So that's yeah, see, and you beat me there. So we each have our own track. So I can call you the angry bird? You can. No, you, I wouldn't do that. Only in private. <laughs> well, are we in private now? Not exactly. So should we say goodbye? I think we should. We should wish some good luck, and I think we both would be... We're ready to help however we can, so call on us if we can be of any assistance. Absolutely. Good luck. Goodbye.